As you know, Nimiji was a towering figure in literature, theatre. He was the first important critic of Hindi novel. He almost founded theatre criticism in Hindi. He established a journal, Madran, which has just completed 50 years of its publication which is one of the longest lasting theatre journal in any Indian language. He is a poet uh, and was included in the path-breaking anthology Lal Saptak. He was widely interested, apart from literature, poetry, criticism and theatre. He was interested in classical music and classical dance. He was interested in science and environment all kinds of communications, the new technologies, etc. So when we, the members of his family as it were, decided to in perpetuate his memory by uh, starting a, an annual lecture series, thought it appropriate that we will call people from various uh, disciplines and walks of life and we had Dr. Mukund Lad, Dr. Krishn Kumar, Mahesh Alpunchwar, Maya Rao, Kumar Shahani, Prabhash Joshi, Govind Desh Pandey, Deepankar Gupta, Hidarnath Singh, Anupam Mishra, Professor Madhav Gatke. And we are very fortunate and there are persons who have already congratulated me on getting Mr. Rustam Bharucha this evening, who I'm told uh, is difficult to <laughs> get hold of. I have, I have been trying myself, but somehow. Anyway, uh, all those who are concerned with uh, the theory of performance, ideas about performance and about theatre uh, would have known about or heard of uh, Mr. Bharucha. He has a very distinguished career and I'm quite amazed even with a streak of jealousy that he has so much experience and so much expertise and so many honors. Uh, he has been a freelance director, a dramaturge, writer for almost 25 years and in a series of interventions in the educational, activist, performance and fine arts sectors in different parts of India, as well as in Philippines, South Africa, Brazil, the United States and the Netherlands. He has directed many plays at the grassroots cultural organization Ninasam Eguru, which was an amazing place and I have been there twice thanks to my friend Yuara Nant Murthy. He has been a research fellow at the University of Berlin, a resident fellow at Cornell University, fellowship of the Regents Office at the University of California, etc. Japan Foundation, uh, and, uh, and it's a long list. And he had very important publications. Another Asia, Ravina Tagore, and Okakura Tenshin, Rajasthan in Oral History, Rupayan Sans uh, no, uh, Politics of Cultural Practice in the Name of the Secular Contemporary Cultural Activism in India, Chandralekha, 
a book which is out of print, I am told, and my friend Samin Kothari wants it should be reprinted. And we from the Raza Foundation are willing to support it. A theater and the world performance and the politics of culture, the theater of Kanailal Pepe and Memoirs of Africa, rehearsals of the revolution, political theater in Bengal, etc. We are also happy to welcome Mr. Madan Meena, who is going to assist Dr. Bharucha in what he is going to do. Uh, he is a curator and a, an artist from Udaipur, no, Jodhpur, sorry, near Jodhpur, and he is the curator of a desert museum of Rajasthan called Arna Charna. And I think Arna Charna will figure in some time in the film. Uh, as you would have no doubt noticed, uh, Charu Katha, enactment, enactments of the broom in oral history, political spectacle, and their life. Uh, this is not a usual topic. It is perhaps even a difficult topic uh, to comprehend immediately. So, uh, there you are. Uh, please come. Here. And may I ask, and you and your letter to offer him. Now, thank you. over to you. Thank you. Thank you very, very much <coughs> for those very warm and generous comments. It's, uh, I feel good to be here, very honored to be here. And especially to invoke the memory of a very special man your family member, uh, Nemi Chandra Jain. Um, to my mind, he was uh, one of those stalwarts of post-independence Indian theater who was particularly committed to defining and promoting modernity in Indian theater. I remember once having a candid chat with him and he was a kind of man uh, you could have a candid chat with you know he 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 didn't mind disagreements you know and I remember sharing with him some of my misgivings about modernity I said you know modernity comes with so many gaps and uh, exclusions and arrogance and he listened very patiently and in a wise way he said yes you're right but you know uh, don't forget, uh, it was a real struggle for us in the 50s and the 60s to make, find a place for modernity. And I respected his position and I continue to respect that, that particular struggle. Nimiji, as you've mentioned, was a judicious, uh, responsible critic and inspiring teacher and in all senses of the word, a very dedicated theatre worker, so I feel greatly honoured to invoke his memory here. Now, having said this, when Kitty got in touch with me a month ago about this lecture, I felt a bit conflicted. And uh, I wanted to do the lecture, but I also had to tell Kirti Ji very plainly that uh, what I am prepared to lecture about has a very harsh content. And I didn't think that this harsh content was appropriate for a joyous, a, a celebration of this, a, a sad kind of celebration that this event embodies. So I was prepared to talk about two things. Um, one was I was prepared to uh, lecture on my ongoing reflections relating to terror and performance. That's my last book. And terror, as you're aware, is a very nasty and brutal subject. And the other thing I was prepared to talk about was my reflections on the broom, but specifically in relation to the extremities of 
bare life, which I'll be talking about, and that is harsh and sad in its own right. So I agonized a bit, and then I said, I'll settle for the broom lecture for a personal reason, and that makes me feel a little warm because there's a person involved who is very precious. Uh, in 2000, uh, this organization uh, had uh, organized a conference on theater documentation in Delhi, which I was very happy to attend, good conference, but also happy because I happened to get reacquainted with a very, very special friend and mentor whom I hadn't seen since 1986, 14 years ago, and that was Komal Kothari. I'm not even going to go into what that man fully represented, but I will never be able to forget that eight-hour conversation I had with Komalda in 1986, where he talked about everything under the sun in his usual manner. And I'm also very grateful to Indian Airlines because the following day, when I was supposed to fly back to Delhi, uh, the plane flew over Jodhpur Airport and never landed. So I, I took an auto rickshaw back to B2 Pauta for another eight hours of conversation with Komanda as some bonus. I never met him after that. And only in 2000 I met him again at this conference holding forth, as you will remember, on intellectual property rights, as only he could. And I was struck by a paradox. I said, look, here we are agonizing about documentation and theater, and here we have in our midst a man with a prodigious knowledge of material culture in India, with a specific focus on Rajasthan. He has a 40-year interaction with local communities living in the desert. And he has this very strange, unprecedent, unprecedented way of connecting different bodies of knowledge. Um, land, water, irrigation, livestock, uh, oral ethics, sati, teratali, puppetry, you name it. And no one has documented him. So in those days, I was free. I'm not free any longer. And uh, I went up to him. I said, can we talk? And we began a conversation which lasted for three years. And it culminated in this book, Rajasthan and Oral History. So my very belated thanks to the organization for organizing that conference, because believe me, if I hadn't attended that conference, maybe this book might not have happened. Thank you. So, what does Komalda have to do with brooms? Well, for many of us, he initiated us to the very idea of the broom. He made us think about the broom for the first time. So the book was published. <coughs> he was interested in building a museum, an ethnographic museum, and he was very clear about one thing, that the museum had to begin with the broom. Now, he could have begun with musical instruments of Rajasthan. He could have begun with Babuji, but he said, no, the broom. At first, we thought too folkloric, the old man's losing it. But after he passed away, and a year later, I assumed the position of project director of a museum that is now called Arunajarna, the Desert Museum of Rajasthan. We were, which was a collaborative project with uh, Kuldeep Kothari, Rupa and Sanstan, and Madan Meena, the curator of the museum, right there. After working on the broom for three years, and a project which culminated in this documentary called Charukatha, which we'll be seeing today by Navro's contractor, I can tell you, this idea of the broom is nothing short but a stroke of genius. It's absolutely unbelievable. So what is so ordinary, so marginal, so utterly not worth thinking about, let's face it, when you do think about the broom and you give it due respect with all its contradictions, the world opens up. This is a world that includes bodies of knowledge, including natural resources. So for us, what is a blade of grass? Just a blade of grass. I learned very soon that in that blade of grass, there are at least four components out of which you can have four different kinds of brooms made out of sirki, sarkanda, moonj, panni. I had no idea. The botanical knowledge of this area is unbelievable. 
The broom opens us to the biodiversity of the desert, agricultural practices, social customs, taboos, superstitions, shamanic rituals, healing practices, modes of production, modes of labor, different communities, different struggles. But today, when I look back on all of these things, I would say that underlying all these phenomena, there is one basic reality that you learn, and that is the reality of caste. I have no hesitation in saying that the broom in the Indian context is synonymous with caste. And in this talk, I'd like to make my very first intervention in trying to link the realities of caste to what the Italian philosopher Giorgio Agamben has theorized as bare life, which relates to the condition of extreme marginality, humiliation, and violence affecting the most abject and downtrodden who lie outside the realm of human society, outside the reach of the law, but who are nonetheless imbricated within the mechanisms of modern democratic society and the sovereignty of the state, which on the one hand bans them and at the same time includes them in states of invisibility. Now drawing on Agamben and reading him closely, a friend, Manush Rai, refers to this condition of bare life as a threshold state of being outside and yet belonging, the state of inclusive exclusion. Now, that's pretty heavy stuff. And I have to say, I wasn't thinking about the broom in this way at all. I'm still thinking about the broom, and I'm, I'm still moving along. And so my debt to Komanda really increases, but I also have to now realize I have to assume full responsibility for what I have to say, because he is no longer around to state his opinion. I'd like to focus now on the last day that I saw Komal Kothari. And I'm not doing this for sentimental or nostalgic reasons. I'm doing this because I want to share with you something I learned from him on that day. And something very, very critical, very hard about caste, about many other things and which I would like to share with you today. Okay, so Komalda wanted me to visit the site of the museum. The museum is built on the remains of an abandoned sandstone mine in a region called Aruna Jharna, Forest Spring. No Aruna in sight, no Jharna in sight. This is a harsh, mean landscape, scrubland, on the way to Arna Jharna, you just see huge cavities in the earth, sandstone mines. And these mines have destroyed the ecology of the desert. They have completely disrupted the riverine culture of the desert. And Komanda always said, the rivulets of the desert are the lifeline of the desert. They're just finished. These mines are controlled and owned by a mafia who are a law unto themselves. We're talking of some fairly nasty people. Now, as we arrived at the crossroads of Arna Jharna in the car, we stopped. Because what we saw in front of us was something so staggering, so vast, so surreal, so unreal, that we were rendered speechless. At least I was rendered speechless because it was the first time I was seeing anything like this. <coughs> Agamben would describe this moment as a condition of testimony of, quote, bearing witness to what is unseeable and unsayable, that is, bearing witness to the impossibility of speech and making it appear within speech. So what I have to share with you today in this memorial lecture is a kind of testimony. And testimonies are risky and vulnerable. Not all of it is scripted. I'm going to speak it out. It's not exactly a testimony the way Agamben would philosophize it. He has some very difficult pre uh, propositions. I will do the testimony in my own way, trying to find words for what I saw. So what did I see? I would say, a field of bones, 
a field so vast, so without beginning or end, that all you could see for as far as you could see was an infinitude of bones. Bones of animals, dead animals, all kinds of animals. Cow, buffalo, goat, sheep, camel, all these animals and clusters, just bones and carcasses of animals. Now, one can, of course, at this point, take recourse, take comfort in metaphor. And you could say, this is a battlefield in front of me. You know, it is Kurukshetra, Golgotha, whatever. But actually, that's the wrong path. Because what's in front of you is nothing less than a dumping ground of dead animals outside the city limits. Outside city limits so that city people don't have to have their eyes assaulted by this, okay? So, as I was trying to take in this site, I noticed little patches of color, like discolored color, like pink and blue, pink, blue, pink, blue. I said, what is this? And then I realized, oh my God, they correspond to plastic, like that's corroding and rotting within the entrails of the animals. Obviously, the poor animals had eaten this plastic during their lifetime, and they had died with this plastic in their stomachs because we know plastic is non-biodegradable. There's something very, very ugly, very surreal, and I have to say deeply pitiable about this condition. It makes you realize we seem to be the land of the holy cow, the sacred cow, and this is what it is. So as I was kind of anguishing about this, Komalda sitting alongside me was completely unmoved, chewing on his beetle nut. And he had other questions to ask. It's not that plastic didn't matter to him, but that was not the issue. And that's what makes him important. So he instructed our uh, members, our team members, I'm not sure if you were there, uh, Madan, to go into the field and observe carefully. Now this is very important. Observation is very important. And he said, look carefully. Are the horns and the hooves of the animals intact? Singhe, Kure, Deko? I thought that's a very strange question. Where's this coming from? And then he looked at me and very simply said, Bones are worth a lot of money. They're used in the glue and pharmaceutical industries. And he was silent. He didn't say anything. I don't wish to mystify that silence, but I knew exactly the context of what he was addressing, because this had come up in our conversations earlier. There was a logic in what he was saying. So what's the logic? If bones are worth a lot of money and used in industries, they have to be collected. To collect the bones, first and foremost, they have to be cut from the skeletal remains of the animals, okay, for which tools are needed and skills are needed to use those tools in the first place. You can be sure that in our country that this task will be relegated, delegated to the lowest of low caste communities, to the most untouchable of outcast, untouchable communities whose birthright it has been for centuries to dispose of the dead bodies of animals. Now for many of us the narrative could stop right there. You would say stop. And you could launch immediately into a denunciation of caste and into the annihilation of caste. And of course, that is legitimate. I don't think Komala would deny any of that. But he would inflect this position. And this is what makes him different from social scientists and from activists. Because he had another kind of knowledge. And what would he say? He would say, you know, Bone collectors are also singers. And this was the kind of uh, insight that he would come up with. And I remember him telling me in this regard, and it's very much in the book, that when he was in the Sirohi region in the winter months in Rajasthan, he had come across a group of people called the Pavia. And the Pavia were earning their living uh, singing songs on mythological and religious themes. And pre-dawn, they would be singing it early in the morning. They'd be going from house to house. 
And in exchange for the songs, they would be getting clothes, they would be getting grain, they would be getting money. In a different part of Rajasthan, at another time of the year, different season, Komanda recalled meeting members of the same community. But this time, they were living incognito. They were hiding their identity. Why? They were earning their living as bone collectors. So he pointed this out to me for a specific reason. He wanted me to understand dual identities. Now, dual identities have nothing to do with the liberal discourse of multiple identities. Dual discourse is about identities that are based on survival through dissimulation. So I asked him, and this is how I learned to ask questions to him, how did you know it was the same people? And Pat comes the answer. He says, I knew if they were part here. Why? Because he said, first and foremost, you know, I could make out from the shape of their huts because I've studied the architecture of their dwellings. Two, from the dialect that they were speaking. And three, from the instrument that they were playing. So I said, what is that instrument called? And he said, Pavia. In that moment, when the word Pavia gets identified with both the instrument and the community, which is both nameless and named, bone collector and musician, there is a combustion of energies at that moment, an illumination of contradictions. So, what does this have to do with brooms? I would say that what we can learn here as some kind of a methodological clue as to how we go about researching oral history. We too are researchers. We are also collectors, aren't we? We collect, we don't collect bones, but we collect information, we collect bibliography, citations, manuscripts. Some of us collect songs, which collect in our, the memory of our computers because we don't have any memory. And of what use is the, are those songs if you don't know where they're coming from and what they are coming out of? So if you don't know anything about the suffering or the desperation or the marginality of the people who are singing those songs, of what use is that song? It's just meaningless data. You know? And I would say, likewise with brooms. For me, the broom today is not just an object. Though, I must say, it's very difficult to resist the fetishization of the object when you museumize the broom. And we faced many challenges in that regard. I'm not sure we were entirely successful. The broom for me is not merely a tool. Of course, it can also be that. <coughs> it's a repository of contradictions. One could say that the raison d'etre of the broom is to clean dirt and in the process to create order out of chaos. Mary Douglas, in her treatise on purity and danger, would insist that, quote, dirt is essentially disorder. There is no such thing as absolute dirt. It exists in the eye of the beholder. Dirt offends against order. Eliminating it is not a negative movement, but a positive effort to organize the environment." End quote. I have to say I disagree with the structuralist thrust of this argument and its peremptory tone. I would argue that dirt offends at affective levels, which get to the very core of what it means to be human, or more precisely, of what it means to differentiate between who is human and who isn't. At the same time, one could argue that in the act of cleaning dirt relentlessly day after day, the broom does not merely become synonymous with dirt and filth, it has a capacity to resist dirt. Now, if a, the broom didn't have this capacity, why would there be brooms in the first place? What would be their function? And in this sense, I think one can speak of, quote, a purity in the heart of the broom, which does not get contaminated 
even through its proximity to dirt and immersion in it. But I would say this is a temporal process because the more you use the broom, the broom will of course get more and more dirty and dirty and dirty and dirty. And maybe there comes a point when the broom can no longer resist that dirt. It is then synonymous with dirt and you could say maybe that's the moment when the broom dies. It's very moving. You know, we never talked about brooms in our entire when we were doing the book for some odd reason. But there was one moment when he said, you know, when the broom gets very old, we don't throw it into the garbage. We just, and he didn't complete the sentence, but he says we just keep it aside. Well, for some communities, the broom is auspicious and worshipped as a goddess luxury, the goddess of wealth. Here one could highlight the sacralization of dirt through religion, as Mary Douglas would argue, whereby the unclean things which have been rejected with abhorrence in everyday life are also made into symbols of worship. But I think we have to be very careful how we are using words like worship and religion and Lakshmi. Yes, there is Lakshmi, but how is Lakshmi being worshipped? What is Lakshmi's role? And as I see it, uh, I would say that the broom operates less as a religious symbol in a very traditional sense than as a monitor of social codes regulating the norms of how the broom should be used or not used in relation to the departure of a bride from her parental home, the arrival of a guest, the timing of meals. But none of this should be essentialized. We must not assume that this is some kind of dictum. For many other communities, there is neither sacralization nor any significant social codification relating to the broom. It is simply a filthy object, a source of contamination, worthy only to be shunned. For some communities, the broom can be used as a shamanic device for all kinds of healing practices and brushing away infectious diseases through different practices called jara. So the different kinds of chara practices. And this would extend across Hindu and Sufi shrines controlled by figures like Jharu Baba and Bungri Mata. And they are not primordial figures. They actually, if you go into their research of these figures, they're relatively recent. They're inventions. So that's a different history here. However, and I can't deny, they have their constituencies, Jaru Baba and Bumri Mata. Jaru Baba is in our film. For other communities, there is no such healing propensity in the broom. It's the very source of infection. Don't touch it would be the normal reflex in keeping it at a distance and out of sight. Now, in a more directly political register, Dalit activists would argue that the broom is so equated with conditions of abject humiliation that it should perhaps be annihilated along with the annihilation of caste. Other activists, who could also be Dalit, while not agreeing with the equation of the broom with states of degradation, would argue that the broom can also be used as a weapon a weapon of the weak, perhaps, but one with its own capacities for shaming and ostracizing upper caste oppressors and patrons. So, for example, I remember Komalda saying that when Manganyas want to disown their patrons, they subject them to different stages of humiliation. And in the last stage of humiliation, it involves a broom. That's the worst thing you can use. So my question to all of you would be, is there in the room a potentiality for resistance even in and through its condition of their life? All these questions compel one to acknowledge the complexity of the broom as a repository of contradictions and it is this complexity that I would like all of you to hold on to as I shift to the second part of this lecture. Okay, so let's hold on to this. Okay. <coughs> Time for some political levity, some comic relief, maybe. So, you ready, Madam? Change, you know, from being uh, 
marginal, invisible. The broom has suddenly acquired a kind of, you got it? A kind of hyper-visibility in the public domain. Okay, so you've already given them the clue, unfortunately. And uh, so the broom has somehow become chic, it's become audacious, it's become linked to all kinds of uh, public relations strategies, okay? And it's circulating wildly in, the, in social media. So it's really going up market, right? <laughs> now, um, so let's uh, begin by, of course, invoking with due respect the Jharu Baba of our times. And uh, what can I say, uh, who happens to hold the highest political office of the Indian state. Narendra Modi inaugurated the Swachh Bharat mission, and it's a mission, keep in mind, on October 2nd, 2014, on Gandhiji's birth anniversary, after a minute of performing the act of sweeping at Valmiki Basti. And I want you to ponder this. He's not sweeping at Valmiki. He's doing a minute of performing the act of sweeping, okay, at Valmiki Basti, following a visit to Rajgad. Estimated to cost close to 133,000 crores in five years, there have been some unfortunate budget cuts here. Modi peppered his inaugural speech with his characteristic rhetoric, emphasizing that the campaign is above politics and driven by patriotism. So some nuggets from his speech. Uh, we gain freedom under the leadership of Gandhiji, but his dream of clean India is still unfulfilled. We have to fulfill it. If we can send a satellite to Mars, can't we at least keep our neighborhoods clean? Good question. But we have to think about what are the technologies needed, maybe not a satellite to Mars. Quote, I am urging people to use social media to further this mission, upload pics of garbage and how you clean it. And finally, a more circumspect statement, if this becomes just another photo op, it will be a disservice to India. Now I'm going to ask you, what do you think that is? Uh, could we go to the next slide, please? Oh, sorry, you've gone to that. Let's go back. You had another slide there, okay. So, what is this if it is not perhaps some kind of a photo op or it could be... I've always been struck by the fact that wherever he goes, his clothes are always sparkly and clean, right? And it could be, um, it, this would be excessively cynical, but it's almost like a washing powder advertisement or something, you know, where you just, nothing is, no dirt is ever going to besmirch those clothes, okay? Now, he says it's above politics. And yes, we need campaigns around cleanliness, hygiene, sanitation, and you would expect an NGO would be handling this, so, you know, uh, you know, neighborhood committees, etc. But this is actually a highly politicized civil society campaign, and it has a huge outreach extending to all kinds of states. Could we have the next slide? Next one. Okay, so here we are in Guwahati railway station, and there are, you know, rows of uh, broom sweepers and a little touch of unity and diversity with the Sardaji very prominently in front. You know? So these are very... It's, it's a jovial <laughs> shot. Next one, please. And of course, here we have celebrities. Of course, this is well known. Uh, Amitabh towering above the rest. It's a nice gradation there. Next one, please. And here we have Salman Khan. Maybe he'd be better off with an AK-47 in his hand. But, you know, I'm, but there he is, you know, posing. And of course, with that, we also have politicians, some of whom have had, had backgrounds in well, if not in cinema and television, next one. Very composed, you know, very concentrated, you know. Focused, very focused, okay. Competent, next one. Now, this is different, next. Here we are. <laughs> now this, now, you know, I really have to apologize. I'm not going to be talking about theater today because my lecture is too long. But you know, what is this if this is not performance? <laughs> this is the performance. How can we match these guys? They have such a plum. They have such flair. And look at the way she's wielding it. She's, per she's playing it to the hilt, yeah? The, and the camera is, of course, staring right at you. Next one. Next. 
I don't know what to make of this shot. I have been stupefied by it for so long, so long, and I'm trying to read significance in it, and that is abs absolutely, and yeah, absolutely. This, uh, it's like a happy family posing with a broom. No, you know, who was it that said that, you know, tragedies tend to be uh, replicated by farce, but in our society, I think that what happens to tragedy, unfortunately, it becomes, it degenerates into a kind of self-parody. And we're entering the, the age of parody, of self-parody. Okay, uh, so what can I say about these shots? I'm not going to do a deep semiotic analysis. Not one of these people knows how to use a broom. Okay, that's I think the first thing that needs to be pointed out. Maybe we need professional cleaners to instruct people how to use a broom. And number two, if we recall the first part of this talk that I mentioned to you in that complexity, well, forget bare life, but the barest references to caste, of course, have been swept away. So this is one political appropriation of the broom in our times. Of course, there are others, and there are no surprises. Let's go to the next slide. Yeah. Aam Aadmi Party. And I have to say I give full credit to the Aam Aadmi Party for finalizing and deciding on the broom as its electoral symbol. I don't know if you've ever gone through the list of all the electoral symbols that are available in India. They are incredible. I mean, you have lanterns and hurricane lamps and sewing machines and umbrellas and cycles and all kinds of, you know, domestic items. But isn't it telling? And I have to tell myself, I've gone through all those symbols. Strange, some of them like ice cream. And you know, like, what is this, you know? Like all kinds of things, very ordinary things. Like, the broom was never used. So I think the Aam Aadmi Party has to be given some credit for saying our electoral symbol for the Aam Aadmi is going to be the broom. And I have to say it's a fantastic shot. I mean, what I like about uh, the, these particular images, and these are all drawn from the net, I'm not dealing, this is not a, an image that Raghubir Singh could have done, and what he could have done with this would have been amazing, that kind of collectivity. I think there are two things I like. One is the collectivity, you know, of the, the images. Like in the early images, it's always luminaries, celebrities, you know, posing with the broom. Here you have a whole group of people. And what else I like is they're not pretending to sweep, okay? Like in the whole of the first part, this is kind of pretext. I'm, I'm sweeping the broom, you know? They're not pretending. They're transforming the broom. It's becoming something else, and it's being used something like a symbol of victory or of, you know, momentum. Next one. There's jubilation here. It's a dance of the brooms, you know, it's this extraordinary, uh, marvelous energy here. Next one. And here, of course, you see how the broom is being used uh, in to demonstrate. So it's got a different movement attached to it. It's not this, it's this. Next one. I like this shot because, you know, here you have this one inscription of a Hindi film poster with KG Wells face imprinted in it. It's not a blockbuster film, it's Nayak Anil Kapoor Stara, he's a reporter, he challenges uh, the chief minister of Maharashtra. Chief minister doesn't like what he's doing, says, so, okay, you become chief minister for the day, etc. I like the fact that this is improvised. It's a kind of one-off. It's not going to be replicated, and it shows a kind of intimacy with popular culture. Next one. Okay, here we have the broomers in our face. Of course, with the traffic in Delhi, this is, you're going to see that broom on behind, and it's, it was very powerful uh, behind auto rickshaws. Next one, please. Yeah, very, this is a sticker. And I must say, extremely, the typography is very well designed. And now, okay, let's move. More recently, this is what it's become. Okay? Now, what has happened when you look at this visual culture around the broom, and I was really quite disheartened, I was going through Delhi and I saw this big boring white hoarding with black lettering, not this one, something else. This one's like a plea, an entreaty, let us do, allow us to do our work. And what struck me was there was no mention of the Ahmadmi party. And number two, the broom had been erased. So then we have to ask ourselves, is the broom only useful during the election time, you know, to get the votes? But now that we are in 
we, we form the government, the broom perhaps is not entirely necessary. And I have to say, I felt very sad. I missed the broom. So on the one hand, when there's a proliferation of brooms with a lot of you know, cosmetic kind of choreography, I want to retreat from it. But when I don't see the broom, in this context, I miss it. Now I have a memory of this. And I don't have an image to show you because the image is in my mind's eye. This was in the build-up to the election at Munirka. I live round the corner from there in JNU. So at the corner of Munirka, just at the corner in the build-up to the election, suddenly that streetscape was altered by one person. And this one party cadre, laborer, worker, was absolutely planted firmly at the cusp, you know. In one hand, he was holding the broom, huge broom, and the broom was absolutely erect, vertical. His hand was like a steel rod, it was diagonal. He was looking straight. His eyes were just sort of boring holes into space, just straight, not one movement, not a tremor. And the other hand, he was holding a placard. It was something like this. Now, if you have to hold that movement for 10 minutes or more, you realize how torturous that is. That's huge amount of energy, you know. I was struck by the dynamism of that. And I said, I have never seen anything like this. And I lived in Calcutta. I've seen a lot of political uh, processions and, you know, all kinds of things. I've never seen anything like this, you know. And I would see it was an assemblage. It's an assemblage of broom, body, placard. And it's not an advertisement. I would say, in somewhat technical language, it's a performative. It's a performative. And the performative is not expressing something individual or of victory or jubilation, no. It's a performative which is commanding your attention. This performative is commanding your attention and it is saying, you will stop, you will see, and you will vote for the Aam Admi. You know? I was very, very, very struck by that. And I do believe that if the Aam Admi swept the polls as it did, I think it was largely due to individuals like that person and many others like him who are nowhere to be seen anymore. And with them, of course, the broom <coughs> is also not to be seen anymore. So I presented you with two different political uses and appropriations of the broom. They come from very two different political constituencies. They have different politics. I don't wish to conflate them. I'm very aware of their differences. However, could we have the next shot? <coughs> when they're brought together, as here, it's chilling. <coughs> because what the image makes you think of politically is what I would call the similitude in the dissimilitude. And it makes you question, how different is the difference? As part of my talk, the realities of caste, of degradation, of humiliation, of poverty, are really being somewhat swept aside. Thank you. Okay. So now let me turn to the third part of the talk. And in this part, I'd like to show you three excerpts from Jharu Katha, by, uh, directed by Navroz Contractor. Navroz is perhaps one of India's most uh, seasoned cinematographers, uh, particularly in the documentary cinema sector. He's also worked a lot with Money Call and others. And I would say working with Navroz closely and with Madan, Navroz is not, doesn't just have a very sharp eye and a very steady hand, though he's becoming a bit of a Buddha, a bit of a Babu. Bab. But um, what I would say Navroz has, he has a very clear professional ethic as to why he shoots diverse situations and communities of bare life, which is a very difficult thing to do. He knows why he's doing it. There's no hesitation. And this comes from being a very seasoned cameraman. I don't have that particular kind of ability uh, to, to shoot, let's say, a situation of their life. Um, so in the first part of the film, you see uh, 
everyday scenes of people sweeping and you realize the labor that goes into sweeping, the hard work, the back-breaking work that goes into sweeping, keep that in mind and keep the Swachh Bharat campaign images in mind. And we move towards uh, a, a very short excerpt of uh, Banjara, broom-making family now living in Jodhpur. They're no longer nomadic. They're based in Jodhpur and they earn their living making brooms made out of panni. Okay, could we start? Louder. This is there. This is in Jodhpur. बस्ती हमारे समाज में ये समझो कि सत्तर सत्तर अस्सी साल से ही बसी हुई है पहले हम नहीं थे यहाँ पे हम तो क्या है कि एक साल कहीं छह महीने कहीं दो साल कहीं ऐसे घुमा कर जाती में हैं उत्तर प्रदेश से ही माल आता है और जैसे अलवर जिला है हरियाणा है पंजाब के साइड में बरसात अच्छी पड़ती है तो वहाँ माल ये होता है मूल का वहाँ से लेके आत राजस्थान में तो बिल्कुल ही नहीं होता जैसे कि आपके पास साफ हुई है तो आपके थोड़ा बहुत माल होगा वो भी मतलब राजस्थान राजस्थान को मतलब पूर्ति नहीं कर सकता फिर भी माल तो उत्तर प्रदेश से लाना पड़ेगा घर क्या कि जंगल लेते हैं उसकी कटाई करते हैं कटाई करके फिर इसको सुखाते हैं सुखाते हैं फिर इसके बाद फिर भरोसे बांध के भरोसे बांध के और फिर हम लेके आते हैं कई क्वालिटी होती है अब ये माल है ये माल इस टाइम आठ रुपए किलो का है बहुत महंगा ही है और ये माल है ये बीस रुपए किलो का है हाँ और एक इससे भी हल्का माल होता है वो तीन रुपए किलो का होता है अलग अलग वेराइटी होती है अच्छा अब हम जो बीस रुपए किलो वाले को लेंगे इसमें हमारे को कोई ज्यादा वो नहीं मेहनत मजदूरी नहीं मिलेगी पूरे दिन खपेंगे तो हम आठ आदमी हैं आठ आदमियों की हमारे दो सौ रुपए की मजदूरी होगी हमने ना तो स्कूल का मुंह देखा है हम तो मतलब जन्मे हैं और ये बजरंग बली का घोटा हाथ में ले लिया ये ले लिया बस चलो काम पे कोई पांच रुपए का कर रहा है कोई दो रुपए का कर रहा है कोई पांच रुपए का कर रहा है कोई तीन रुपए का कर रहा है कोई आठा देने का कर ये बच्चा है आठा देने का कर है छह लड़कियां हैं दो लड़के तो पहले हम तो पानी को भी तोड़ के पीने वाले जाति से हैं कि सौ रुपए का खर्चा मत करो उसमें से पिचानवे रुपए का ही खर्चा करो और दो सौ रुपए कमा रहे हैं तो हम पांच रुपए रोजाना के अलग से कर रहे अब मैं भी चाहता हूँ कि मैं भी कोई बंगला बना लू कुमार जन का पर वोट करने से और थोड़ी होती है वो तो कुछ ना कुछ डबरी तो अब हम नहीं नहीं है तो क्या करें मरते कहा जाए दूसरा कोई वो है नहीं हमारे पास है जरिया कोई खर्चा किसी से हजार पांच हजार ले रखे हैं किसी से दस हजार ले रखे हैं किसी से पांच सौ ले रखे हैं ले रखे हैं किसी से बीस हजार ले रखे हैं तो 
धीरे 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 तो करूंगा कहीं से सौ ले आता हूँ कहीं से दो सौ ले आता हूँ कहीं से पांच सौ ले आता हूँ कई कई मेरे उस काजे से ले जाते हैं तो वो पॉकेट में ही निकाल देते हैं रात को भी गया था मैं भजन गाने के लिए अब रात आठ दस दिन तक मतलब उनके घर भजन गाए और उन्हें मैं बस एक सिक्के पर खिल खींच दिया कि धन्यवाद पहले भारत लाते थे तो गाड़ी मोटने वाले लगे और फिर छुरी कंगी बेचने लगे लकड़ी की कंगी लाते थे कहीं से बनी हुई बेचते थे तो ये प्लास्टिक वाले कंगी वाले लगे पीछे हमारे समाज के तो पीछे लगे हुए और अब हम इस काम को झाड़ू बनाने के लिए लगे सर्दी बनाने के लिए लगे सर्दी बनाते हैं तो पास हो गई जटाई निकाल दी पैसों वालों ने प्लास्टिक के निकाल दिए कोई पैसा निकाल दिया कोई पैसा निकाल हमारे समाज के गरीबों के तो पीछे लगे हुए हैं इसमें मेहनत दस गुना है हमारे हाथ से काम हो रहा है वो एक ही मशीन दस हजार जानू एक दिन में बना देगी और मेरा परिवार क्या मेरी पूरी कॉलोनी पूरे दिन के अंदर दो हजार जानू नहीं बना सकती बल्कि दो हजार क्या एक हजार जानू नहीं बन सकती क्योंकि हमारा मेहनत ही काम है मेहनत पूरी है मार्जिन नहीं है so i forgot to serve here it's not easy to add sir yeah. a film with one hour long and it's it's a disservice to the film and i apologize but for the purpose of the argument i want to build here i want us to think together about <coughs> the gradations of bare life in relation to the particularities of caste now we think that caste always operates with a kind of a singular force but when you actually deal with the actualities of caste there are these multiple configurations multiple contradictions and multiple negotiations of exclusion and inclusion so in this particular sequence here i think what comes true is that millions of brooms continue to be made by hand in india every year it's one of the largest industries imaginable but it's not just the hand that is making the broom and it becomes very clear from seeing the evidence here that if you deal with the performativity of labor one would need to consider the entire body of the broom maker which serves as a technology for the production of brooms the entire body mobilized from the toe to the teeth in a continuum of ceaseless energy and that's what you saw over there inevitably there are health hazards if your body is going to be used as a technology day in and day out so that young daughter of gopal banjara tugging on a teeth with her twine will obviously is likely to lose her teeth in the process and this is the inevitable collateral damage of extreme forms of labor which are essential for sustainable livelihoods now there's a small inscription in the sequence of another kind of labor and i don't know if you picked up on it call it cultural labor which relates to gopal banjara singing of bhajans he mentions that now he hopes to earn a little extra money from the singing but returns empty handed from an ostensibly upper caste home with a tilak on his forehead so his bitterness and mute anger are clearly expressed and you you could see that however this opportunity to sing bhajans does reveal a certain flexibility in gopal banjara's world in so far as he is able to cross the threshold of another community's household this indicates the possibility of inclusion in a wider social framework but ultimately of course he has no other option but to return to his hut which is also his factory pounding on panni with hanuman's mallet in his hand day after day year after year so this may not represent bare life in all its darkness but it's certainly a hard life testifying to a bleak existence with no future in sight now from this broom making context i'd now like to shift to two brief articulations made by members of the bagaria community who are associated with the khejur broom the date palm broom broom Now the Bagarias are the largest, largest nomadic broom-making community in all of Rajasthan, and you can find them everywhere. You can find them on the sides of highways. You can find them on the extremities of villages and forest areas, and even in distant states like Kashmir, 
where they are harassed by the police and armed forces. All of this is in the film, we won't be able to show it. Now, what's important here is that in our research, they are the most economically impoverished of all broom-making communities and the most divested of political <coughs> rights. In this excerpt, we are not going to uh, focus on the production of the broom. We're going to listen to two stories of humiliation. Yep. That's the Kajul broom there. Sound, please. I think that line, are we animals, gets to the very core of the ethos underlying bear life, which as Agamben would put it, occupies, in his words, a zone of indistinction and continuous transition between man and beast. Now, the Bagarias do not work with animals in any way, but this does not stop them from being perceived as animals. Of course they can fight back, but they are perceived as animals. Now their humiliation is complicated by the fact that they are ranked OBC in the caste hierarchy, which in our research was the highest reserve category of broom makers that we encountered. But they OBC, but this does not stop them from being treated as untouchables. Very clear evidence here. Nor is their economic status in any way benefited through this reservation category. If anything, it works against their interests because they are entitled, not entitled, required to buy land only from upper caste groups like Rajputs and Jats and not from low caste communities, which in effect renders them landless. Such are the cruel contradictions of caste. Now, in our investigation of caste, and I should make it clear, we're not social scientists, we're not sociologists. <coughs> we're just drawing our information at, at, at very grounded levels. But we noticed that there were at least five different components of caste that share a disjunctive relationship. 
One is, of course, the inherited caste identity made palpable through blood ties, family, marriage. The reserved caste identity designated by the state. And here, as many of you are aware, it is possible for members of the same community living in adjoining areas not to have the same reservation category on account of bureaucratic complications. And these bureaucratic complications play havoc with people's lives. In addition, there's the actual social identity by which communities are perceived by others. And I think there is no through line between your inherited identity, the reserved identity, and the way you're perceived. They're different sometimes. There is also economic mobilization to consider and social stigma. All of these elements do not necessarily correspond to each other. They operate through disjunction and contradiction. Therefore, even as the Bagaria are ranked higher in the caste hierarchy at a ritual level, this does not stop them from being impoverished and treated like untouchables. Conversely, and this brings us to the third example, where we deal with the self-defined Harijan broom-making community. And I'd like to stress self-defined. This is not how we are designating them. This is how they choose to represent themselves in the absence of a strong Dalit movement which has been unable to make any inroads in fighting the very strongly entrenched feudal structures that continue to prevail in Rajasthan. But in our research, what did we find in the broom-making community? We found that compared to the Banjara Se and the Bagaria, that the Harijans would appear to represent more economic mobility and certainly stronger political rights in relation to their representation in sabhas, panchayats, political parties. But none of these factors have succeeded in diffusing or diluting the virulence of the stigma of untouchability to which they are inextricably linked. So there are two specific ways in which Harijan broom makers, I would say, are distinctive. First, at a time when natural resources are scarce, compelling broom makers to switch their allegiance to making brooms from different materials. For example, the Bargudna community no longer focuses its energy on the Kajur broom and has switched to the full jaru, which is more economically marketable. So, you know, if we had to make this film, let's say 10 years from now, maybe Gopal Banjara would not be making brooms out of Panni any longer. And indeed, already the people in this uh, documented here, like uh, the Bargunda uh, broom maker here, well, they're not making brooms out of Khajur anymore. They're making brooms out of Fuljaru. But the one thing that is not going to change, in my view, is that the Harijan br broom makers will continue to uphold their monopoly over the bamboo broom. That will not change. That is their domain. This exclusive right which is also economically beneficial because the bamboo broom is worth a lot more than the broom made out of panni or a kajur, well, it also succeeds in deepening their social exclusion. So it works both ways. And secondly, unlike other broom-making communities, the Harijan broom-makers do not merely make brooms, they also earn their living by using brooms as municipal cleaners and in other capacities as well. So let's examine some aspects of their labor in the last section of the film. May I sound? Okay. Let's see. I'm 
harshest and most brutal representation of bare life that one could imagine. And here, of course, I'm referring to the manhole sequence. We do not merely see the body of the broom maker serving as a technology for producing brooms, as in the Banjara sequence. We see the body of the manhole cleaner cleaning the manhole as a technology in its own right through its immersion in sewage. And this evidence of human waste is perhaps India's deepest shame. Now, when we look at the episodes, and I'm sorry they were very cut for the sake of time, what did we see? We saw a transition from the world of the broom to the realities of waste. And this transition is, of course, activated in that remarkable sequence involving the street vendor Solanki, Ahmadmi of all Ahmadmi's, I would say, who spares no one from the mayor to the cleaners in his irreverent, abusive, no holds barred condemnation of all concerned who fail to do their duties in an abysmal surrender to corruption, laziness, indifference, and a total abdication of civic and social responsibility. There is a point during the sequence where Solanki stands up and, as you saw, literally leads the camera which has no other option but to follow him to a glaring spectacle of waste. Waste that is so differentiated and prodigious, seeding with an almost incremental growth, that it compels one to ask a basic question. And the question is, is there a future for the broom in dealing with the sheer scale and density of waste? And it would not seem so. What is needed are new technologies of waste management, dumpsters, vacuum pumps, poker drives, and recycling units, almost all of which were defunct at the Jodhpur municipality during the time of our research. And I think this is true for just about every municipality all over India. The machines don't work. Now this is the irony. Our technologically savvy government takes pride in supporting every possible gadget from smartphones to the most sophisticated developments in nuclear and space energy. As the PM himself has acknowledged, we can send a satellite to Mars, but we cannot keep our neighborhoods clean. Perhaps what we need to reprioritize are the technologies of the everyday. No point going to Mars, I would say. And these technologies of the everyday supplement need to be supplemented by rigorously enforced civic mechanisms 
which have to begin with the sorting of garbage at a domestic level, which is the starting point for any waste management. However, it could be argued, and I don't think this is a cynical position, it could be argued that we have our own indigenous human cleaning technologies in the form of servants, sweepers, scavengers, and manhole cleaners who are expected to clean the dirt so long as they are around, why should others be responsible for soiling their hands? Returning to the manhole sequence in Charukata, I'd like to shift the focus a bit. <clears throat> and I would say we're compelled in the sequence to accept the limits of representation. We faced a lot of pressure to delete the sequence. But in doing so, I think we could only have capitulated to the erasure of bare life which the state chooses to render invisible. I would say there are three stages in the sequence. First, of course, we see the cleaner immersed in filth and sewage, his head dislocated from the rest of his body. There's a clear demarcation. Second, we see the cleaner being hoisted out of the open manhole, right? So there are helping hands there indicating a degree of touchability. Now let's keep in mind that this sequence is taking place in broad daylight on a street. We didn't have to hunt for it. It was there, okay? It's another kind of public spectacle with the local community serving as spectators. And I think we've all seen this that when indeed a drain is blocked, and we were talking about this earlier, of course, this is the drain, the sewage that's coming up in our own very, our own toilets, but when the manhole is blocked, well, the whole mohalla is out there. They're all watching it, okay? I must say in this regard, in our research, we encountered more humiliating instances of bear life, which were impossible to record, not least because they were not performed in the public eye. And that's the difference. <laughs> Everything we have shot in this film, the person knows that he or she is being shot. It's not clandestine. It's not voyeuristic. But there were times when we were doing our early morning research, as you remember, where we would see a solitary uh, cleaner working hard and really hard at dislodging a drain blocked with plastic or whatever, and you realize it's a series of failures. The broom doesn't work, the tools don't work, the rod doesn't work, this doesn't work, that doesn't work, and ultimately, what does he do? He falls back on his hand to dislodge the plastic, and this is the prototype of the broom. And that is the most humiliating and most unseeable of things, and for my, from my point of view, for me, unrecordable, because he is being viewed without his knowledge, okay? That is a big difference. I would say the third sequence here is the cleaner moves away from the manhole and after a moment or so, with very little editing in the sequence, I should add, he looks into the camera and of course with a smile says, what can we do? We have to earn our living. For us, it smells like a rose. This statement challenges and confounds I have no desire to interpret it and thereby fix it by describing it as ironic or humorous or transgressive. I would like to leave the statement as it is, allowing myself to be challenged by its force and provoked into writing or failing to write about it. Even as the statement has the danger of lapsing or playing into a validation of humanism, and humanism can be quite insidious in dealing with the rep representation of their life. The statement <coughs> also remains, I would say, the last thing that one would expect to hear from a cleaner who has emerged from a manhole. It challenges one's critical reflexes and politically correct responses. And in doing so, it offers evidence of the illumination of oral history that resists the formulation of the social sciences with the volatility and unprecedented immediacy of the human voice. So in conclusion, <coughs> one could say, 
What's the point of anguishing about the limits of representation? Given the severity and harshness of bare life, isn't it more important that some action should be taken? What can one do about bare life? One could, for instance, invoke the law and support the banning of all dehumanized instances of bare life like manhole cleaning and scavenging. However, we need to keep in mind that many such laws have been passed by the Supreme Court. For instance, the law against child labor. But this hasn't prevented children from being used and abused like slaves. In such cases, we invariably, we, I mean the middle class uh, inhabitants of civil society, we invariably fall back on a factitious lament. The law is good, the implementation poor. I think we need to start deconstructing this lament as nothing more than a means of postponing the need for action in an endless deferral of responsibility. In the context of bare life, the role of the law is all the more complicated, not least because of its imbrication in political life. As Eva Ziarek has put it, bare life is always already captured by the political and the agencies of the state and the law through its unlimited exposure to violation, which does not count as a crime. So if acts of manholing and scavenging had to be declared as crimes, who would be declared the criminal? The manhole cleaner or those who allow the manhole to be cleaned? Where and how would one begin to mark the criminal and decriminalize the crime? In another formulation, we learn that, quote, even though exception is not codified in law for exception to work, it needs a legal constitutional order in the first place. The extra juridical for Agamben is not non juridical, but very much premised on the juridical. In simpler language, one would say that even as acts of bare life like manhole cleaning lie outside the realm of the law, they do not cease to be legal. Such are the duplicities that need to be dealt with in engaging with the law. Beyond the law, there are other lines of action that can be pursued in relating bare life to activism, to education, and to cultural practice, even as there does not seem to be any particular cognizance or need on the part of theatre practitioners today to engage with the realities of bare life. And I'll be happy to talk about this in the discussion and mention some very startling ways in which bare life has been represented in Europe, though I fail to find such instances in the Indian context. So through all these initiatives of relating bare life to activism, to education, and to cultural practice, the broom itself is not likely to disappear. Having survived for centuries, it has established its uses in the domestic and some sectors of the civic sphere, even as I pointed out, new technologies are urgently needed to deal with the scale of waste. I should add that in our research with the broom makers in Rajasthan, at no point did we encounter any rejection or contempt of the broom as such. On the contrary, there was considerable pride in the broom, even assertions that it could deal with the global market. It would be patronizing, if not a mistake, to view this pride and defiance as signs of the false consciousness of an exploited people who are unable to examine their condition critically. This is not the reality that we encountered in our research, as is only too evident in the articulation of multiple broom makers and users in Charukata. Perhaps <clears throat> what is needed is not the elimination of the broom, but the rejection through strong critical questioning and social action of the mindsets, the behavioral patterns, the stereotypes, the taboos 
the selective uses of the broom, the delegation of the broom to specific communities, all of which are incapable of being addressed without a serious recognition, or dare I say, cognition, of the underlying realities of caste. There is no point in invoking the individual responsibilities of all citizens in the larger mission of cleaning India if the equation of dirt with the denigration of non-citizens representing bare life is not squarely acknowledged. The task that lies ahead involves not just a denunciation of the upholders of caste, but an acknowledgement of how caste continues to be invisibilized or tokenized even within the most democratic and secular agendas, including mechanisms like reservations. Outing India's shame and articulating it against the status strategies of inclusive exclusion could be the largest task that lies ahead for the redefinition of our hopes in an increasingly embattled and compromised democracy. Thank you. Well, friends, you have heard a very brilliant and in many ways a very disturbing presentation by Rustam Haruta. Now there's some time for you to, well, about 10 to 15 minutes, if you would like to ask questions. The questions have to be brief and precise, and not vague, and not too general, etc. That's a tall order. Ustam, I have seen this uh, in Bhuvishwar, Jatin Das had shown this film, Nauruz had come over there. It was not so poignant as it became today when you saw the three sections there. But tell me, Ustam, at the end, when you say it about this big demonization and criminalization, we were growing that line, how does the law, when you say about Supreme Court, where does it happen then? What happens with the law part of it? Well, the law part is very, as I said, very uh, tricky because on the one hand uh, exclusions are not included in the law but that doesn't mean that what is excluded is not allowed and so it, it is not seen as a criminal kind of action so it's a kind of a double bind and uh, there are many things in our society which you know you know we say well we have a terrific constitution we have I think the Supreme Court can surprise us ever so often with I think strong judgments as they have recently had one but I think it's perhaps not just the law you know it's a combination that is needed and that's why many people today and I in my book on terror for example I the law comes in very 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 strongly in my book on terror because I feel the only way perhaps in which terror I don't think terror can be stopped but in which there can be some accountability you know some way of uh, dealing with uh, the devastation of people's lives is for some for justice but of course we know justice and the law are not necessarily synchronous but I've noticed that when I present that uh, that kind of argument for many uh, lawyers it's very interesting the lawyers are, are very skeptical that the law can do much about terror mm. and they say it's one way of in a sense deepening you know, uh, the problems, but I don't fully accept that argument, you know, I think we need the law, you know, I'm, I'm kind of perhaps, uh, but um, I think the law uh, works with its own kinds of duplicities uh, in passing perhaps progressive judgments sometimes in the case of women's movements, well, they fall back on very conservative kinds of arguments and so on. I don't think you can dispense with the law, at least that's my position, but it needs to be constantly supplemented by activism. And I don't see activism alone as a solution. So many people who say, let's not have the law, let's, let's turn to activism, and I think, well, activism comes with its own kinds of hierarchies, its own kinds of traps, you know, and uh, different kinds of agency and so on. And that then leaves open the whole area of cultural practice. I mean, if I could have gone on for another half, half hour, so I said, stop it here. 
And I, I deeply regret, Kirti, that I could not include the, the section on theater, mm -hmm. but I can talk about it now and uh, share with you that some theater people here who might want to hear it. Yeah, I would say it's outside, but it's that inclusive exclusion. Yes? Yep. Why have you not included gender in this uh, discussion? I couldn't include everything, you know. It's like, uh, <laughs> but, uh, well, in our research, I mean, if you see the film as one hour, that very interesting, you know, the, the broom industry is massive. Um, a lot of brooms are made for use value. They're not, uh, for example, sold in the market. And all the brooms that are made very personally uh, for specific use uses are made by women. So in our museum, and I would say the most precious brooms that we have are, have been given as gifts to us, I would say, I don't know how else to say, by women who have made brooms of their own from whatever materials are available in their, in their habitats. And each of these brooms is a creation, you know? It's, it's, they're deeply, I don't want to, you know, aestheticize this beyond a point, there are dangers there. But they are very, quote, beautiful brooms because of the, the kind of care that has gone into making that broom, whether it's out of twigs or twine or whatever. They're highly personalized brooms, and they do not, of course, get sold in the market because they're made for very specific uses, and they come out of very specific habitats. Now, uh, the gender, well, in, if you just take the Banjara community that you saw, the whole family is involved. I might add, the women were, uh, his daughters in particular, were very much part of the workforce. I noticed that the two sons were running around most of the time, not doing any work, you know, but, uh, all the broom, uh, all the communities we saw, uh, women play a huge, huge kind of role. Um, and in the final municipal sweep, as you saw a whole group of women over there, very much under the thumb of the male supervisor whom they have to follow. Yeah, but yeah, gender is huge. And of course, there's a whole section that we, it's in the film, it's on, well, Codes, superstitions, taboos, you know, invocations of the broom as a goddess Lakshmi and there. It was women who had the, the, the most uh, detailed stories, you know, and uh, very, very deep insights. But some of them were very violent even. They said, uh, if a daughter-in-law doesn't know how to use the broom, we get rid of her. <laughs> very violent. Very, very violent uh, uh, kinds. And it's a lot of... Uh, caste inscriptions and all. So that's there, you know, it's not as if women are free of violence in their association with the broom, not at all. And it's seen as a, as a kind of dictum, it's a kind of uh, marker. Have you got a good daughter-in-law in the house? Does she know how to sweep? How do you sweep? And this old lady we have, she's amazing. She demonstrates how the elbow has to be used. Now, of course, of all this a little bit of expertise could have got, gone into the Swachh Bharat mission, maybe it could have been a little more informed about India's multiple cultural traditions, etc., etc., etc. There's a lot of, uh, well, uh, skill that goes into the use of a broom, yeah, labor. Could I talk a little bit about theater? Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I had a whole section and it couldn't fit into this, so, okay. Um, Agamben, when Agamben talks about their life, um, well, he has very, very harsh um, examples, the starkest being Auschwitz and uh, the role of inmates in Auschwitz who are very tellingly called Muslim. And I find it a bit staggering that Agamben never, ever deals with the fact that they are being designated as Muslim. He just takes that as a given, but of course for us, Muslim cannot be separated from Muslim. I won't go into that. I, I do find it shocking that he doesn't actually engage with that basic historical reality. Yeah, one second. Um, I, um, along with uh, Auschwitz, of course, it's refugees and asylum seekers who today are seen as among the largest uh, 
you know, group of people whom we would associate with their life. And of course, on television, we are seeing many, many horrible examples of what we now call boat people. And boat people who are, of course, drowning on the seas, trying to cross from Libya or wherever to Europe. And of course, Europe has shut doors. So when, if they do manage to cross there, where are they put? You know, and what is their status? Who are they? And the situation is particularly bad in Australia, such a civilized, developed country. And the, the situation there is, is really uh, horrifying in terms of divested of rights. That is bare life. That is really bare life, you know. Now, how has the theatre world responded to this uh, in Europe? Uh, you all have heard of Elfriede Jelinek, the, the great Nobel Prize winner, the Austrian feminist. Well, she's written a very powerful text based on Aeschylus's The Supplicants, uh, where she talks about these, well, it was inspired by a group of asylum seekers in Austria who sought refuge desperately in a church because they were going to be deported, you know. And she's created this uh, text, which I happen to see in Mannheim in the premiere of the big Theater de Welt. And I can't go into the production, but let's say it was one of these post brechtian post-dramatic spectacles. And the key fact I want to bring in is that there were some 25 real asylum seekers who were part of the company. So you had actors and you had real asylum seekers working together in this very, very, let's say, powerful spectacle. And uh, it, there was this rousing curtain call and uh, asylum seekers mm. and actors were doing their curtain calls, you know, in the European tradition. And it all seemed very inclusive. They're all part of the, they've been included into the bourgeois theater world. And what happened when we went out into the lobby, there were these serious analytical discussions about asylum seekers and some of a colleague was speaking. And I noticed that the asylum speakers were not speaking. They were on the fringes of the lobby. And there's the exclusion for you right there, you know. So they're being in included only to be excluded. Now that is changing, I believe. They are now being included, but of course, no one in the audience is going to say, excuse me, why don't you come over to my home and stay with me, you know? Why don't we just practice hospitality, you know, in the real? That's not going to happen. Okay, that's one kind of example. Now, we have performances by real asylum seekers in, in camps, as they're called. And I've mentioned this in my book on terror and performance, where they have resorted to very extreme acts of performance, like lip sewing and blood graffiti. That means cutting their veins and taking the blood to paint freedom slogans on the walls of the prison that no one will ever see. But these are new kinds of performances, if you will. The Australian state looks upon it as barbarous, and that's surely very ironic, because people wouldn't be sewing their lips in protest against silence if they hadn't been put in those conditions in the first place. A third example would be a performance artists who, in solidarity with these crimes, have resorted to very extreme acts in their own right of lip sewing, sewing eyes, branding their bodies with markers like alien. And these have been very extreme acts. And I find them courageous. But I would like to make a distinction between these performative acts and the acts being made by the real asylum seekers. And in my field in performance studies, there's a debate about this, whether one should be seen as more of a performance than the other. I would just say they're different kinds of performances. And the difference is simply this, that the performance artist who is protesting against this is protesting out of what I would call outraged citizenship. That person is a citizen. Now, you may be railing against the state, but you're a citizen, okay? And you're doing it in an art gallery, etc., etc. Those guys are not. They're not citizens, they're not non-citizens, they're what? There's something between man and beast. This is the Agamben kind of situation, and I might add, appropriations are always around the corner. So when the slip sewing started for the first time, guess what? Fashion magazines took that over, 
and models began to sort of use makeup to show lip sewing as part of their solidarity with <laughs> what was going on. So I mean, these appropriations, it's not just an Indian kind of condition. We are quite innocent sometimes, you know, when you think of that television group, you know, posing with a broom, for God's sake. But <laughs> I mean, that's quite innocent, I would say. But uh, yeah, these, appropri these are different kinds of performances. Now in India, I think you'd like I have not, uh, basically I would say, and I think Nemi Chandra Jain would be very interesting, I'm sure he's listening to this wherever he is, uh, I'd say in the earlier uh, years, in the 60s or in the 70s, not just in theatre but in cinema of course, the representation of the labourer, of the worker, you know, of the destitute, of the poor, was far more evident. I cannot think of today's Bollywood heroes playing anything resembling bear life. You know, I just can't. There have been some interesting film narratives, ironic narratives, I rather like that, you know. So when I was racking my brains, it's not that I didn't think about this. I said, when did I see uh, a real, really interesting representation of bear life? And I found myself turning to, of all things, the prologue to Utpal Dutt's Tinir Tolvar. Now, the prologue to Tinir Tolvar begins with this manhole cleaner coming, popping up from the trap door and making fun of this drunken poet, you know, he's quoting Madhushadan and, you know, he's flamboyant and he's totally drunk. And it's a fantastic conversation between the two of them where the manhole cleaner takes dirt and throws it on him. And Utpal was absolutely brilliant in that scene. And it showed, it was not trying to, it was not a social realist representation. It was not something perhaps on the lines of an Usha Ganguly's Lokata or my, it wasn't working within that kind of an aesthetic. It was far more ironic, far more epic. But that was one uh, episode that made me think of what would be the representation and what are the traps perhaps of realism. And then I found myself uh, thinking of the landmark production that I think would have to be taken on if you want to engage with the narratives of their life, and that would be historic production that's Bijan Bhattacharya's Nabam. And that's the real marker of Ipta, you know, in some ways. And that, as we know, dealt with the man-made famine of Bengal, where three and a half million people died, you know, who starved slowly to death. And Calcutta was full of what Agamben would call the living dead, you know. That was, it didn't stop the theater from continuing in Calcutta, I might add. I mean, restaurants were full, life went on, but there were these people who were dying <laughs> on the streets of Calcutta. And there are these brutal, brutal documentations of you know, people throwing a scrap of bread or whatever, and people like just like animals, if you will, just grabbing whatever they could. I mean, this is, as, this is stark. This is really harsh. I think, unfortunately, our knowledge of theatre, and we have some theatre historians here who would know, I'm afraid that we haven't really done our work on what actually happened in the representation of their life in dealing in Nabondo. And what has happened with the historiography of Nabondo is a clash of personalities. You know, the famous one being Shambhu Mitro insisting that uh, the production had to be staged on a revolving stage. You had to have a revolving stage, otherwise right? Nabondo cannot be performed. And the Communist Party of India and the ideologue saying, what are you talking about? where indeed is a revolving stage that we can work on today. And, you know, all the historiography is more or less around that and the actual embodiment of bear life or the transference of what Bijan Bhattacharya was seeing on the streets of Calcutta and what was happening on the stage, we don't have enough. But so it's this controversy, but I think we can learn from the controversy. And I would like to put it like this, that um, it's easy to reject Shambhu Mitro's position. You can say you're out of touch with reality, but actually aesthetics do matter. They are hugely important, you know, if you're doing a play, you know. And uh, 
he was trying to find an aesthetic model, and for him that was the revolving stage, to represent something very stark. I think, on the other hand, the, the politicians and the politically inclined needed to think if, well, if Shombu Mitra was thinking of the aesthetics of politics, they needed to think about the politics of aesthetics. And I think uh, this didn't happen with enough complexity. There is a wonderful moment uh, that is narrated by Malini Bhattacharya where she talks about Nabondo playing in a, in a rural area of Bengal. It's a wonderful moment. And a very committed party worker gets into a panic and goes backstage and says, provide a translation. People don't understand what you're saying. Now, I, th I wouldn't look upon this, I wouldn't be cynical about this moment. I take this moment with deep seriousness. This is a moment of crisis. How do you represent people that you don't allow it to become a kind of reassuring spectacle playing into your own kind of security? I do believe bare life, if I had to say the aesthetics of bare life, has to be disturbing. There's no other way. Otherwise, it's a bit of a trap, I think, to take it on. So the aesthetics of disturbance, I think, is something that we need to think about. But how you disturb, the options are open. It could be through humor. It could be through visual imagery. It could be through installation, whatever. I, I have no idea. I think the options always have to be left open. But uh, it's not easy dealing with this material. Yeah, please. Is Anamika production of Uchakka. Okay. Uh, which was about about a tribe based on this novel by um about the criminal and so I'd like to have seen that. I'd like to have seen that. See but uh, see if you you know, when you say criminal tribal, thinking of Dakshin's work, Dakshin Bajrangi, uh, a Budan theater in, in Gujarat. Now, that's, uh, now he is indeed uh, self-defined, a person who identifies with his, uh, with his uh, caste identity, Chara, and uh, he, uh, who are regarded to this day as criminals, okay? Now, Dakshin's approach to that would be one of, well, not, um, you know, representing uh, the starkness and the, the harsh violence to which his community has been subjected, but he takes a more, I would say, developmental approach to the situation, you know. So um, they have, for instance, done collaborations with the police. And the police have been the greatest, you know, uh, you know, the people who have condemned the chara, who have persecuted the chara. But, well, this is a way of negotiating your status, okay? And so they've done, uh, the police also have their own civic agendas. They want to, you know, come across like being sensitive citizens, you know. So there are all these, I wouldn't be, I am open to different negotiations. So long as they are followed through, yeah. Just to just uh, uh, what uh, uh, Gigi pointed out about which mm. has very many levels of disturbance, uh -huh. and not always, um, uh, not always something that asks you to recognize the disturbance. Right. I want to just bring another another uh, example, and that's Nirbhaya. Okay. That was done by uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I think one of the problems uh, which would be uh, uh -huh. immediate is about the real. I mean, when you bring somebody who yes. has suffered disfigurement <coughs> uh, by acid on stage, That's what terrible. are we saying about the real and what about we, are we saying about uh, the experience of disturbance? Yes. So, I mean, there could be whole spectrum, spectrum. of disturbance. Absolutely. Nothing but sensationalization of the worst kind. The worst. I would, I would, I would take it to calling it almost obscene. Very. That, you know, you are actually thinking of what is the audience taking, or yes. what is the nature of what you feel uh, um. appalled by, or uh, 
you know, deeply um, shocked. But this is the, the yeah, yeah Yael Faber's work is particularly, <coughs> I would say, distressing. And I don't normally, uh, um, Miss Julie. her Miss Julie was one of the most obscene things I've ever seen. It is one of the most sexist productions. It was taught in, in um, Cape Town, South Africa. And it was done in one of those South African settings where, you know, Miss Julie is the white, you know, brat, as it were. And, uh, the, and Jean is the black <coughs> stud servant. And the sexual violence that was represented on the stage, and I don't want to go into it, but let's say that Miss Julie, as we know, and Strindberg's play exits, you know, and uh, I think, and uh, we don't see her, you know, killing herself. Over here, because it's a rural setting, she impales herself in her private parts with a farm implement by just doing this. And you see this action. Now, what shocks me uh, is that this is a super hit. Yes, but so was, so was it's, uh, uh, Nirbhaya is a super hit. So now, then that opens up some really harsh questions about what are people consuming and why are they consuming what they're consuming? Can they not see? You know, something that is so utterly crass, you know, and, uh, you know, what is it? You know, and this is something that stupefies a great many people about all kinds of performances. It could be Modi Swaj Bharat Mission. Why does it hold? Why does it capture people's imagination? What is going on here? You know, what is facilitating this total suspension of critical alertness or just civic responsibility as a spectator? You know, what is it? So I think uh, the only hope, I think, Anu, would be the disturbance that that kind of experience leaves with the spectator, you know. Because if there's anger in the spectator, I have faith in that. Maybe that anger can be translated into something else. And, you know, and, uh, but the, the worst thing would be this kind of, uh, kind of reassurance through shared victimhood, you know, which is utterly, I think, voyeuristic and sensational in this case. So I'm afraid, uh, you know, as much as we appear to be getting quite alert about how we deal with the complexities of desperate situations, we still seem to be falling into traps over and over again. And these traps are very commercially viable. What can I say? But that shouldn't stop people from saying it can be done differently. And it can be done with imagination. And, uh, you know, I would bring up Maya's work in this, because now Maya's also bounced up the Nirbhaya. I have great, uh, a great uh, regard for Maya's work. Uh, my students watch, have been studying Maya's walk for a long, long time. And uh, I think it's gone through a huge process. Now, what was important, I think, about the walk is that Maya refused to actually engage with the actual violence of the body that was done on the body of that particular victim. And, uh, but there was a rage that uh, was unleashed through that moment. And that rage was something that was particularly palpable in its early performances. Now, as the walk has grown and evolved and become more a play about consensuality than it has about that moment, that violation, I fear another set of problems could be emerging. On the one hand, you can try, you can become, quote, so close to that moment of violence, you know, that there is the danger of luxuriating in that kind of violence. On the other hand, you can move away from that moment of violence, and then it becomes something else, you know. And then you begin to wonder, well, what was that moment? What was that event which, you know, sparked and catalyzed that piece in the first place? And then I think it would simply be wise for people just to stop doing certain things, you know, and create new narratives, you know. There are no solutions here. Yes? Uh, Thank you. Uh, my point is that if someone asked me to go out of the government, then I would ask them to ask them to ask them to ask them. 
आपने एक उसमें केजरीवाल की सरकार के उसमें दिखाया था मैं सिर्फ एक छोटा सा कमेंट करना चाहती हूँ वो दिल्ली सरकार ने अपील जारी की थी और जब सरकार अपील जारी करती है तो वो अपना सिंबल नहीं लगाती तो ये वाली बात अगर यहाँ पर आती है तो इतने बढ़िया ट्रॉप में ये एक तरह की ऐसी चीज है जो वो पुनः हमें उसी उसमें लाती है कि हर चीज को मतलब अगर हम इंस्टीट्यूशन और इसका वो नहीं करेंगे तो अल्टीमेटली उसी तरह के परफॉर्मेंसेज होंगे जैसे कि परफॉर्मेंस के अभी आप कर रहे हैं तो कि फिर हम एक्सपेक्ट करेंगे कि सरकार अपने सिंबल को लेकर आए इस पर थोड़ा सा I don't know. Are you referring to the poster? जो poster था जो ये था कि दिल्ली सरकार को काम करना हाँ दिल्ली का सरकार को अगर वो अपने political किसी meeting में if they don't put the boom yeah then of course they have to yes yeah we must make a point and we must be there yeah point out that yeah done that yeah but as a सरकार as a government they should not put their symbol they should not put their symbol I think that is the politically correct answer that is true that now you are in governance. You're no longer fighting uh, for your election, but I find this. Uh, I think you are politically. On, it's a clear point, and I think they are also clear about that. But I can't help saying I miss the broom, you know, and that is a personal kind of response. I miss the broom because for me that is antiseptic. For me, this is the language of governance, you know, and I want a different kind of gov. I want governance. But I want somebody to reinvent governance. I don't want that language of governance. For me, white and black, come on here, that's clinical. It doesn't convince me. I want something else. I think culturally, I'm I'm disappointed in that. But like in Joa Bolori, that is absolutely true. Maybe you can't have uh, Amadmi Party, Broom. That's it's a different point now. But now I find it is like I have to be very responsible. You know. I have to be a serious, you know, uh, you know, chief minister, and I somehow miss the fact that uh, the defiance and the playfulness. And why should, if you become, uh, let's say, if I become a professor, does that mean I have to cease to be an artist? You know, I, <laughs> that particular one. Now I agree with you. I agree with you. But I was disappointed when I saw that white and black. लेकिन मेरे लिए आई फाउंड दिस वेरी डिप्रेसिंग ब्रूम नहीं हो सकता है या बट यू कांट या बट आई थिंक यू राइट बट दैट्स अ गुड पॉइंट बट द थिंग इज व्हेन यू क्रिएट न्यू इमेजेस द ओल्ड इमेजेस डू नॉट डिसअपीयर फ्रॉम योर माइंड दे विल ऑलवेज बी देयर इन अ वेरी डिफरेंट सिनेरियो एंड आई एम गोइंग टू शिफ्ट द and made ram into this kind of militant you know kind of figure in this sort of rambo kind of mood yes on the one hand you could be distressed but i would always say never forget there are thousands of years of ram there and ram exists you know in many many different ways you know you can't wipe that out you know what i mean it's still there these are like derida would say palimpsests you know they don't get erased and that's all i'm saying that For me, the the broom is that man holding that broom, and that is what I want to hold on to. But I agree with you <laughs> that if you are in governance, then you you have to yes. change your language, uh, Haji. Uh, Hasan, I just since you did bring up Maya, now I just wanted yeah. to connect on this that we were talking about the performance and hmm. discontent, and you know what role it plays. And with Maya, I was trying to uh, hmm. get in touch with you to think about the. Uh, the pedagogy of this country. Yes. And how do we use their life? Or how do we? Yeah. In what way does theatre in education play what even the text or uh, a, you know a classroom discussion cannot do? And that was the main challenge. Yes. I think that as you know, Maya is moving more and more into the yeah. pedagogical frame because mm -hmm. her today her heart and soul is in theatre and education. I think that's remarkable. Um, There's a room for uh, pedagogical frameworks for theatrical invention, and I'm not sure that the aesthetics of disturbance is necessarily appropriate always within a pedagogy of theatre. Um, but I, I just saw. I've seen the walk many times. I'm a great admirer of the walk. I just saw it in Hyderabad just uh, a month ago, 
and for an academic audience. Now we know that theater will always change according to the space, according to the time, according to the spectators who are there, you know, it will automatically take on different tonalities. And it was a fine, actually very polished performance. I've seen more unfinished performances which have been powerful. But I felt um, the pedagogy of the, the enactment was moving towards, as I said, consensuality. It was moving towards how do we make young men and women realize that there is a need for asking permission and a certain negotiation before you become intimate with each other. And in Indian context, this is hugely important because we do not uh, consider uh, the importance of these codes in negotiating sexuality. Certainly in rape, this doesn't exist at all. But I felt somewhere along the line, the pedagogy was, was over emphatic there, you know? And the disturbance which has always been there in the early performance was lost. And I have to talk to Maya about this when I meet her. And uh, while I fully accept that it has to, you can't repeat that one moment. That's not possible. I mean, my students say, oh God, when Maya came to JNU and that's after that first performance, 31st of December, it was like, you know, we, we couldn't believe it, we couldn't believe it. I said, but you know, that was the moment, that was the historical moment, you know, you were out in the streets, there was agitation and all that, you know, that's part of the performance, you know, <laughs> historical moment is an integral part of performance, you know, you can't separate it. We're not living that moment anymore, you know, and uh, so we have to move on, but in moving on, what do we forget? What do we let go of? Does rage disappear? Does anger disappear? You know, does the fantasy and the, the jubilation of a movement disappear? Like when you come into an office, isn't that always the problem with a lot of politics? Is, you know? And that uh, we had, you have so much faith you know, in a certain kind of energy and then you, you win the election or you become a professor or you do this or you do that. And then you're expected to change your behavior. On the one hand, yes. This is appropriate. This is the, the right thing to do. But um, sometimes I, I feel that in the case of very critical uh, events, like what happened on December 16th, um, how do you keep representing and invoking those events without losing their extremity? I think if you lose that extremity, and it's somehow domesticated within your, your agenda, whether it's domestic, then I feel a little disturbed. But it's tricky. I'm, I'm not uh, in any way critiquing Maya here. I'm just, I think she would understand this situation. Uh, in terms of pedagogy and bare life, very, very hard. Very hard. I, I, you know, I, I would have to take this very seriously. Uh, how would I, for example, talk to high school children about Auschwitz? Mm. You know, how? Or about partition, you know? <coughs> what would be our way of, you know, getting across this, uh, you know, what happened? Um, yes, you need to tell stories, maybe. You need to, you know, have some testimonials. Yes, it might be useful. But we have to be careful that uh, you know, this doesn't become too easy, too simplistic, you know. And I would say in the final analysis, if it makes young people think about what they have to do, we will have done a little bit of our job, you know. I feel so long as they leave that class thinking, fine. We can't do everything in that one, you know. But thinking is important, you know, and not just, you know, resolving and um, things, yeah. Yeah. Achaji, I think I. <laughs> well, <coughs> thank you very much, Mr. Barucha, for this brilliant uh, lecture and the <coughs> conversation and the film and the and all of you. Uh, thank you on behalf of Mimi Nidhi and Natran Pratishthan. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.